from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 213, recorded on January 24th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and other guests. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, did you get home safely from the incubator on Friday? Oh, absolutely. It was a great ride. Good. Very, good. very nice also, lift. Thank you for the uh, financial support, by the way, John. You're welcome. Appreciate it also, very much. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And to uh, tonight we are going to solve the case of the young boy in uh, Uganda. So, Daniel, tell us all about that. Certainly. So, let me start for those of you tuning back in and those of you tuning in for the first time. On our last episode, our mystery case was that of a 14-year-old boy with a history of slow, progressive development of abdominal ascites over years, a big fluid-filled belly. Uh, He appeared wasted and malnourished. Uh, He did not have a fever. Um, He did not have a history of weight loss or night sweats, no history of TB exposure. We'll take that for what it's worth. Uh, He was HIV negative. Um, He had an older brother who died the year before um, with a very similar presentation. Uh, The assumption was it was perhaps the same disease. Um, And we also were told that he had lived uh, his early life uh, by the shores of Lake Victoria, actually where he swam quite a bit. Um, And that's where we left it. And I think we're going to be, let's see, reading a bunch of emails and then we're going to what kick Dixon off so we've got an extra spot to have a guest come on and do the unveil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do need space. That's right. It's fine with All me. All right. Good number of guesses for this one. Thanks for coming up, uh, folks. What do you call it? When st- stepping up to the challenge. There you go. There you go. Okay, Dixon, can you take that first one, please? Sure. <clears throat> Chris writes, hi, TWIP team. Snorkeling with cichlids and invasive Nile perch in Lake Victoria has always been a dream of mine. However, thanks to TWIP, I learned that one should not enter the water from the shore, as this is where the Sicaria of Schistosoma hematobium and S. mansoni live. Instead, I should enter from a safer, deeper distance, where my only concern would be hungry crocodiles and territorial hippos. These critters newly emerged from their Bulinus and Biomphalaria snail hosts swim to the top of the water column and seek exposed skin to bore into. Once inside the host, they will embark on the scenic route before ending up at their final destination, first visiting the lungs, the heart, the liver, and then the veins, undergoing a complex transformation into fully-fledged schistosomes along the way. Once two adult flukes find each other, they will embrace in a lifelong cuddle session They will then travel to either the venous plexus of the bladder or the mesentery and finally settle down and produce eggs. These eggs will then have to find their way out of the venules and into the external environment. A process that I'm not sure I fully understand, the eggs are transported across the walls of the venules and into the lumen of either the bladder or the colon, depending upon the schistosomal species. I simply remember that hematobium has heme in the word, which is blood, And it reminds me of a bloody urine, so I know that that one goes to the bladder. Some models I read uh, deposit... uh, hmm, I'm having trouble making sense of this sentence. Some models models I read posit. Some models I read posit that I that the eggs are carried, in quotes, (laughs) across the different layers of tissue by the immune system, while others say the eggs somehow dissolve their way through. Maybe the seventh edition of Parasite Diseases has the answers, but alas, I do not have a hard copy. One thing is for sure, lots of fibrosis of tissue accompanies this process, especially if the eggs get stuck and the immune system endlessly tries to wall them off. At some point, too many eggs end up deposited in the small portal venules of the liver, which leads to cirrhosis and portal hypertension. This is exactly what I believe our patient is suffering from. 
For treatment, a short course of praziquantel should kill off the adult parasites, as well as some safety counseling to prevent further infections or future infections. This could include vigorously toweling off immediately after a swim, as Dr. Griffin often states. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the damage to the liver is far more complicated to treat, and liver transplantation may be needed. We can come back to that point later. Hopefully, I did not just write all of this just to get a wildly wrong, like my tongue of penetrans guessed the last episode. That was a good learning experience, however, since I assumed a negative skin biopsy should have ruled out leishmaniasis. A lesson to double check and question everything. Thank you for all you do, Christopher. Dixon, how did the adults find each other? Delightful. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, right Owen writes. Dear TWIP team, I haven't guessed in a while and feel bad that you didn't have many guesses in a recent episode. I have finally caught up with my backlog. I'm up to date. So my guess for this case is that the ascites is due to schistosomiasis acquired when he entered the water of Lake Victoria. There may also be some hepatosplenomegaly contributing to his abdominal distension. Hope you all had a great Christmas and New Year. All the best, Owen. Daniel. Sarah writes, hello, Dr. Pommier, Griffin, Naula, and Rockin' Yellow, and Happy New Year to all who celebrate it. It's 6 degrees C, 42 F, and drizzling outside. I'm hurrying to send this guest because I submitted my last guest just a few hours after you recorded the last episode, oh. which was very sad for me as I'd love to win a book someday. Swimming Lake Victoria and Ascites made me immediately think of Schistosoma species, particularly S. Mansoni. I considered several protein malnutrition, so quashi orker, severe protein malnutrition, quashi orker, from an intestinal nematode, the liver flukes, fasciola hepatica, opus thorcus and clinorcus, and peritoneal tuberculosis, but the liver flukes would not cause portal hypertension, and the geography is wrong. Mycobacterial infection would not earn this case a spot on this podcast, although I'd love to see you make a This Week in Mycobacteria podcast discussing NTM, not tuberculosis, mycobacteria, TB, tuberculosis, and lookalikes. I suspect this patient has periportal fibrosis and granulomatous inflammation resulting in portal hypertension from the body's own immune response to schistosoma mansoni eggs deposited in the youth's liver. The result is clinic clinically significant portal hypertension with its associated ills, portal caval shunting, gastroesophageal varices, and risk of bleeding, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, not to mention chronic malnutrition leading to even lower albumin in his vasculature, further exacerbating the ascites through decreased intravascular oncotic pressure and halted growth development. A diagnostic paracentesis would likely show an elevated serum to ascites albumin gradient, which in this patient would point to portal hypertension from some process. But to get at the cause would require finding the large S. mansoni eggs and their single spike possibly in the patient's stool sample, though as Dr. Shauna Gunaratne taught us last episode, a rectal SNP might also yield the same result. If S. mansoni eggs were found, I'd give Prosequantil and hope to reverse his portal hypertension to any extent possible. I'd follow up with stool samples to confirm eradication. Um, if there is time, I have two questions for you experts. If this patient has a high burden of eggs, could treating him trigger a dangerous immune response and temporarily worsen his illness? I'm thinking of the neuroimmune response when a patient with high burden of filarial worms such as loa loa and oncocerca is treated with DEC. I know swimmer's itch can be caused by duck schistosoma species that remain confined to the skin, similar to cutaneous larva migraines. Why is it that duck schistosoma cercarii cannot circulate and become adults in humans? As always, with gratitude, Sarah. And a lot of good questions we got to circle back to there. A lot right. of good questions. I can answer that one really quickly, though, because once the Sicaria of duck schistosomes gets into human uh, bloodstream, they realize that we can't fly south in the winter, and they, they just don't care anymore. They just lose that's interest. The, that's the scientific answer. Okay. Uh, Drudy <laughs> writes, Dear Twip quadrifecta. Quad, quadfecta. 
A 14-year-old boy who's malnourished and has less developed and has developed societies over the years is a very grim situation in Africa and Asian countries, including ours. He can have any nematode infection like roundworm, hookworm, which can lead to anemia and protein losing entropy. Enteropathy, sorry. Dr. Shota also mentioned a really impressive abdomen, which may be seen due to hepanosplenic disease. Hepanosplenic disease in Africa opens a Pandora's box of differentials like chronic malaria, visceral leishmaniasis, abdominal tuberculosis, splenic abscess due to salmonella, leukemia, and hemoglobinopathies. As the patient does not have any fever, most of the above-mentioned differentials can be ruled out. But when I googled Lake Victoria, most of the articles were written specifically about one infection, schistosomiasis due to schistosoma mansoni, based on host environment agent and disease. <clears throat> excuse me, I am narrowing my guess down to schistosomiasis. The patient may have acquired it by swimming in the lake. Contamination of lakes with feces is an important epidemiological factor for the continuing schistosoma life cycle. Disease is because of the disease, the eggs causing intense inflammatory reactions leading to development of pseudopolyps in the intestine, resulting in blood and protein loss eventually to development of ascites. Schistosome eggs can cause intense periportal fibrosis in the liver called Simmers fibrosis, progressing to portal hypertension, splenomegaly, and esophageal varices. Diagnosis can be made with stool microscopy, when you can see the eggs with a lateral spine, characteristic of S. mansonari. Serology, how much of it is useful, I don't know. Radiological investigation can be done to look for various organ involvements. Treatment with a single dose of praziquantel and examnequin is effective to stop further shedding of eggs. Adding, ex adding ex oxamnequin and praziquantel has shown good res improvement in patients with hepatosplenic disease and schistosomal polyposis. Whether repeat dosing is required or not can be decided on clinical outcome post-treatment if patient is not improving and repeat stool examination findings. As always, prevention is better than cure. <clears throat> safe drinking water, safe recreational sites, adequate sanitary facilities, reduction of animal reservoirs, as usually mentioned by Dr. Depamier, are some of the preventative measures. In India, we have a national program, Swak Bharat Abhyayan, <clears throat> Clean India Initiative, which focuses on improving sanitary facilities in rural India. It is a good step towards limiting the spread of easily preventable infectious diseases in a developing country. Thanks for the edutainment. Uh, and this is a physician, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Druti Seth. In your best accent, Dixon. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> Gina writes, Dear Vinny and the Twips. Oh, that's a good name for a <laughs> rock band, don't you think? Vinny and the Twips. How could we not do that? We like it. Is it Ascaris lumbricoides? I'm a little stumped, but I understand you can get it from swimming in a lake. Welcome back, Daniel. Have a good trip, Christina. Thanks for everything, Dixon and Vincent Gina. All right. All right. Michelle and Alexander from the first Vienna Parasitology Passion Club, right? Dear <laughs> Shisto Somu ladies and the Shisto Somu gentlemen. We are very excited to have won a copy of Parasitic Diseases. The book will be made available to all current and future trainees at our Division for Infectious Diseases and Tropical Medicine in Favoritum, Vienna. A 14-year-old boy presents with a distended abdomen and ascites. They outline the case there. The differential diagnosis for ascites is generally quite broad. Taking into account the epidemiology, two different mechanisms can be differentiated. Protein deficiency, secondary to malabsorption, and portal hypertension as a consequence of liver disease. In the absence of other edema and with changes in portal flow on point of care ultrasound, the second mechanism would seem more likely. Furthermore, intestinal infections with geohelminths 
Trichurus, Trichurus, or Ascaris can usually be identified on stool microscopy. The most likely diagnosis here is infection with Schistosoma mansoni, which is very prevalent in Uganda, about 25% nationally, um, some areas even over 50%. Uh, the parasitic worms are transmitted. I, I added that part, sorry. The parasitic worms are <laughs> transmitted as cercaria on contact with fresh water, which is the habitat of their intermediary hosts, freshwater snails. The cercaria develop into schistosomulae, which migrate throughout the vascular system and ultimately land in the liver. There they develop and migrate further to the venules of the intestinal tract where a male and female reside in copula doing the deed. How do they find each other? Well, that's easy. <laughs> they find each other delightful. As a consequence of this delight, eggs are produced and shed in the stool, contaminating fresh water yet again with S. hematobium. This happens in the bladder. The eggs hatch into um, mericidae, which penetrate into the snail and exit and cercaria again. Sometimes fish and other aquatic creatures can serve as paratenic hosts, which means they provide transportation only. The first symptom of schistosomiasis is usually this so-called swimmer's itch, which presents as a macular papular rash at the point of entrance on the skin. Acute systemic symptoms may include fever, dry cough, muscle aches, hepatosplenomegaly, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Symptoms of chronic schistosomiasis depend on where the worms migrate and lay eggs. The symptoms range from acute bowel obstruction and intestinal ulcers to esophageal varices, ascites, as seen in our patient, cancer of the bladder with S. hematobium, seizures, or even motor impairment if the brain is affected. Some patients infected with schistosomiasis do not experience any symptoms at all. The diagnosis is usually confirmed by detecting eggs in the stool or urine, other methods include PCR testing and antibody detection. The two main treatment options for schistosomiasis are prosequantil and oxamnequin. Prosequantil is cheaper and therefore more commonly used, but is only effective against adult schistosomes and not against eggs and immature worms. The eggs may be excreted by people infected with schistosomiasis for weeks after having received treatment, and the immature worms have the ability to survive and develop into adult schistosomes following prosequantal therapy. <clears throat> Because of this, it is advised to perform repeated testing of the stool and or urine for schistosomiasis about four to six weeks following the treatment with prosequantil. Avoiding contact with or ingestion of contaminated water in endemic regions is the key to prevention of this disease. In high-risk populations, mass treatment with prosequantil is sometimes used for prevention. Thank you for this great case. All the best, Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. Nice. Now, I guess I'm next. You uh, are. Kimono writes, Dear TWIP team, the two soil-transmitted helminths, Ascaris lumbricoides and Strongyloides stercoralis, came up as my two final contenders for this 14-year-old boy's illness. Both are quite prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa and can cause a swollen belly and peripheral eosinophilia. The abdominal distension in A. lumbricoides can be from the bulk of worm burden and eventual intestinal obstruction, which can lead to death and perhaps the demise of his older brother. Strigeloides stercoralis and S. filiborni can both also cause abdominal distension and anorexia, but seems also associated with diarrhea, which was not described. Daniel notably mentions ascites, which is a fluid accumulation usually due to serum hypoalbuminemia, i.e. low protein levels, which due to an osmotic effect draws fluid into extravascular spaces like the peritoneum. In advanced liver failure, it is due to lack of albumin production by the liver, whereas in infections like Ascaris they mention malabsorption of fat, protein, lactose intolerance with anorexia, all of which would cause severe protein malnutrition and could lead to ascites. And since the PD-7 chapter on Ascaris has a picture of a child with a swollen belly, I'll go with this. Ascaris eggs are described as being incredibly hardy and infectious. Uh, and infection is via the fecal oral route, typically in contaminated foods. The embryonic egg is swallowed, 
The parasite hatches in the alkaline environment of the small intestine, penetrates the capillary, and is carried to the portable circulation of the liver. It then travels via the bloodstream to the heart and further into the pulmonary circulation, where it ruptures into the alveolar space. It can then crawl up into the pharynx, be swallowed, and end up in the intestinal lumen a second time, where it molts, matures, grows, and eventually mates. I imagine this boy became infected at a very young age and is likely being continuously reinfected since one adult female worm produces on average 200,000 eggs per day and the sanitary conditions are likely poor. It is possible that he at some time experienced a pneumonitis known as Loeffler syndrome with bronchospasm resembling asthma. Mention is also made of the worms migrating in response to irritation like fever and can lead to perforation or obstruction of the biliary tract or peritonitis. Diagnosis is by identification of eggs on stool exam as well as serological tests to ascaris antibodies and PCR slash molecular tests. In suspicion of hepatobiliary ascariasis, ultrasound and ERCP may be helpful. I imagine that Dr. Daniel may have examined the boy's stool as the eggs are often prevalent but maybe they could be seen by portal ultrasound when diagnosing the abdominal ascites. Treatment of choices with albendazole and mebendazole, which are used in deworming programs for children. Intestinal obstruction may, of course, require surgical intervention. As always, eager for the next twip to drop kimono. P.S. At the end of the recent TWIV, I was thrilled to hear a listener email Maureen from SUNY New Paltz, that was a dear grad student friend in Fred Alt's lab back in the 90s. This inspired me to reconnect. And as for my interest in TWIP, I can simply state that as the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was unfolding, colleagues at work began turning to me with questions about virology and basic immunology, which led me first to TWIV and then eventually most of the other Twixes. A slightly reduced workload and inspiration from Daniel led me to led me to a volunteer experience with floating doctors in Panama this summer with my 17-year-old daughter. So here is my plug. We both had a very uplifting and bonding experience and are soon returning for a few weeks in late February, a tradition we hope to continue as she flees to college next year. My monthly response to TWIP cases keeps me learning, and someday I would love to visit you in the incubator. Maybe I'll bring Marlene along. What a great story that two former grad students connected over yeah. a podcast. Yep, yep. We <laughs> bring like people it. together. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and then the parasites come later. <laughs> Elise writes, Dear Twip Collective, it's January and I'm back after being seriously out of step with you all for months. I hope the new year is treating all of you well. It's sunny and windy and weirdly temperate for January here in lower Manhattan. 52F 11.11C. I'm writing today with an attempted diagnosis for this poor, ch poor child who lived on Lake Victoria. My concern is that he has a schistosoma infection. This parasite is quite common in much of the world. And for this case... In Lake Victoria, it's transmitted to humans by snails, which live in water bodies such as Lake Victoria and are intermediate hosts for the worm larvae. Schistosoma infections can take different forms depending on how the body of the host responds to the worm larvae and where they take up residence. Initial symptoms of an infection can take the form of flu-type symptoms, but left untreated, a wide range of gastric and renal symptoms can manifest as they have done in this child and in all likelihood his brother. A diagnosis can be most readily made with a blood sample and the parasite can be eliminated with a course of praziquantel. I do, of course, have questions about how to treat the child's other symptoms, particularly his abdominal ascites. Does this resolve on its own? Would he need to have fluid manually drained? Will he be able to recover somewhat after treatment? I did read that very young children experiencing these infections can experience learning delays, which largely resolve after treatment. But since this boy has been ill for so long, will the effects be able to be reversed? As always, thank you so much for your amazing work. I may have fallen off the map for a moment, but please know that I am here and taking so much interest and pleasure in everything you have to say. Best wishes, Elise in Lower Manhattan. Good to have you back, Elise. We did miss you for sure. All right, Andrew writes, Kia Ora from Pongaroa. 
I have been remiss in sending in a case guest recently, but I have a reasonable excuse. <laughs> I've been helping <laughs> a friend turn her PhD thesis into a book. Having to explain English prepositions to an Italian native speaker left me exhausted. <laughs> the English language is far from logical, but the book is with the publisher and undergoing peer review. I was too mentally exhausted to tackle any problems requiring thought. I even stopped doing redactal. Here is my guess for TWIP212. The location and the ascites made me think of Bill Hartzia caused by Schistosoma mansoni. I wanted a second opinion, so I asked the AI chat apt. Here is the answer. The most likely parasite responsible for the symptoms described in a 14-year-old boy with a history of slow progressive development of abdominal ascites over years who appears wasted and malnourished is Schistosoma mansoni. This parasite is a common cause of abdominal ascites and malnutrition in regions where the parasite is endemic, such as near Lake Victoria. The infection is acquired through contact with contaminated water, and it is common in areas where people swim, bathe, or wash in freshwater sources. I checked this against my copy of PD7, and it looks good. <laughs> nah, Andrew. You guys, you guys know about this, yeah, uh, I this do. AI thing? I do. I was able to get an account a few weeks ago. Now it's all backed up. But um, it's really remarkable. You ask it a question, and then I asked it, what is a virus? And it spewed out three paragraphs that were pretty good. Pretty darn. <laughs> I asked, who's Vincent Racaniello? Knew who I was. Really? I asked, I asked hey, who's Amy Rosenfeld? And they didn't know who it was. This is like a Siri that's been upgraded? It's a... It's a it's an intelligent uh, query engine. And, it, uh, uh, apparently, it took the uh, US MLE exam and passed on the first try. That sounds wow. like a Watson. So, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So now so everyone I'm, is going to do the TWIP thing <laughs> on this. <laughs> and they're all going to be the, the same as the consequence. AI. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear. Uh, uh, let's see. I guess I'm next. Martha yeah. writes Dear Twippers. Again, phone typing, brief, and no italics. A 14-year-old boy who, was abdominally with, who has abdominal distension from ascites is described as appearing small for his age and malnourished. His older brother died with a similar condition. He is from Lake Victoria region. Eukaryotic parasites that cause ascites hookworm infestation can result in severe anemia and hypoalbuminemia, which produces ascites from decreased colloid oncotic pressure. Stridulates can also produce ascites by this mechanism of action. But since the um, case history includes Lake Victoria, then Schistosoma mansoni pops up to the top of the list. Eggs from worms in the mesenteric venules can get into the portal branches in the liver where inflammation causes fibrosis and stricture. Children develop hepatosplenomegaly and portal hypertension. So my guess is schistosoma mansoni causing hepatosplenic schistosomiasis, portal hypertension, and ascites. Best wishes to all, Martha. Daniel. It's Daniel, right? Isn't it? Or is it? I Vincent? think it's you, Vincent. It's you. Okay, Vincent, you're on. All right, Felix Rice, <laughs> your trip team. I hope this guest reaches you in time. I am a med student from southern Germany who has recently been to Africa, where I got interested in tropical diseases. Weather near the Alps is finally getting cold, and maybe on the weekend we will have enough snow to start the backcountry skiing season. Regarding the case, my first guess would be Schistosoma mansoni. This waterborne parasite perfectly fits the geographic description. The common hepatolenal manifestation will cause periportal fibrosis, which leads to intrahepatic portal hypertension, which then leads to ascites, can later develop into cardiopulmonary schistosomiasis. The diagnosis can be made by microscopic stool examination. Serology would probably not be useful for diagnosing in endemic areas. Praziquanto's drug of choice. I do not know much about the time course of the portal hypertension or potential esophageal varices after initiating treatment, but I guess in some cases medication like propanolol or even interventions would be useful if available. Some more unlikely and less parasitic differentials would be ascites from malnutrition or neoplastic disease. All right, Aaron writes, greetings all from an overcast St. Louis 
where the temperature is currently 36F or 2C. My guest for the case presented in episode 212 is Ascaris Lumbricoides. I'll be brief since I'm just a web developer at WashU School of Medicine, but I'd like to think that working on all the websites for the school, some of the knowledge from the doctors I've worked with has found its way into my brain. Actually, it was Vincent's comment about the similar picture in PD 7th edition that led me to my diagnosis, that poor child. I hope the child from this case was treated with mobendazole like the case presented in the book and was able to recover. My wife and I found the Microbe.tv family of podcasts in January 2020 when one of her coworkers suggested we listen to the experts about this emerging virus. It turns out that our connection to Dixon goes back much further than that. Monsters Inside Me was, and still is, must-see TV in our house. So when I found TWIP, we said, wow, this is just like a podcast version of the show. And lo and behold, it truly is thanks to Dixon. Thank you for all you do and keep up the good work. Dixon, uh, you on that show? I I haven't been on it for a while. I don't even know if the show has uh, been renewed. It uh, I was on, I think, six years in a row, though. It was a lot of fun. Huh. A lot of fun. Cool. Alice writes, hello, TWIP doctors. Thank you, Microbe TV and TWIP, for enriching my ID education with evidence-based and clinical cases of parasite education. In regards to this week's case, after spending some time in Kampala and in Tebi and seeing patients with complications from Lake Victoria, I suspect this patient has complications of chronic infection with schistosoma mansoni. Manifestation of chronic disease is due to chronic egg deposition within tissues, such as intestine and liver, leading to granulomas. This then leads to hepatomegaly from portal fibrosis and subsequent splenomegaly, leading to this patient's large abdomen. Treatment for chronic schistosomiasis is praziquantel. In young children, I have read that this might reverse some of the portal fibrosis. Therefore, I hope this child is young enough to see benefits. I have received a book recently. Therefore, please do not include me in the draw. Thank you all, Alice. And... She's an adult and pediatric infectious disease fellow. Tom writes, dear TWIP host, first time emailer, long time listener, more than 10 years. I'm an infectious <laughs> disease fellow at the University of Minnesota. I work a bit in Uganda and have made stops at Montefiore, Internal Medicine Residency, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm writing now from Kampala, so this case seemed fitting for my first guess. For our young man on living on Lake Victoria, he's showing unfortunate signs of portal hypertension and an older brother recently died of the same disease. The list of parasites causing these symptoms is relatively short. Diagnosis, schistosomiasis. Eggs can be detected on a stool sample, though the sensitivity is not great. Treatment, praziquantel. Until next time, Tom from Kampala, Uganda. Very cool. Very How about cool. that, Daniel? You got somebody else there. <laughs> I think I think this is great. I mean, uh, Tom and Alice. I'm sure we have a lot of uh, uh, friends in common. So uh, cool. say hello to everyone. Um, it, it's kind of a small world, you know. I, I think Indeed. we saw that right at the AST M and H meeting. <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's right. So. All right, now All right. Dixon. well, we have two more guesses, I oh, think. And, <laughs> and, and I think uh, <laughs> before we give away the book, uh, Dixon, did you did you have any thoughts, comments? Um, I had one thought, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. <laughs> A singular thought <clears throat> that this is uh, right up. I loved teaching this section to the medical students, actually. There's a lot of complications of this infection that you can talk about. And you can also demonstrate, as Dr. Harold Brown did while he was in charge of the same course, that many people have it without knowing it. And he used to actually invite one of those people to the class. And he would interview him basically in front of the students and ask him how he was feeling. He said, I feel fine. He said, well, uh, did you know that the laboratory test came back positive for schistosoma mansoni? And he said, yes, I did. You told me that last week. (laughs) I said, "Did did, did that affect how you feel now? And he said, not at all. He said, I don't even know what that is, but I can tell you that I have never felt better. And he turned to the class and he said, this is not an atypical case. 
And if, if allowed to go further, and if the same habits are followed, then this would obviously lead to a clinical situation. So those patients, when treated with, in those days, they weren't treating with prosequantol because the drug hadn't yet come out. They were treating them with some horrible toxic compounds that you had to inject over a 30-week period with um, one of them was called Fuadin, named after King Fuad in uh, mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> and several others have liked that. People uh, sort of rejected the uh, treatment after about the third or fourth injection because it really hurt, and uh, it destroyed muscle tissue at the same time. But a single pill of Raziquandil was the absolute downfall for this parasite in terms of its epidemiology. It's It's really... Uh, been shrunken in terms of where it's found, but nonetheless, uh, the real cure for uh, schistosomiasis, in my view, is to improve the economic status of the area, which then makes sanitation possible, and then after that, everything else follows. So not only do you cure schistosoma, but you cure a lot of other infections as well. Yeah, schistosomal mancinitis is my guess. So you're going with schistosomiasis. I... Why so. not? Why not Ascaris? Oh, um, oh, let's see. Why not Ascaris? We had a few Ascaris guests. No, we did. Right? We did. We did. We did. We did. Um, well, well, Ascaris doesn't lead to portal hypertension for one thing. So portal hypertension is a, a symptom of, uh, as I said, Simmers fibrosis, mm-hmm. where the um, portal circulation, the the pre uh, portal circulation, I should say, becomes um, uh, fibrotic <clears throat> due to the fact that the egg gets stuck in that vessel before it can actually get into the liver itself, which, by the way, following back to the case that I read earlier where I said we can return to that um, piece of information, the liver itself is not damaged at all by this infection. Mm. So liver function up to the very last moment before the capillaries the precapillary uh, uh, sinusoids are trapped by all of the eggs. Let's say you get millions of eggs, and and, and 80% of the uh, precapillary sinusoids are occluded. At that point, you could then have liver failure, but you don't mm. get to that point usually with that infection. It's uh, got lots of other ramifications before that, but but the liver itself is spared. And so when you look at a, an autopsy of somebody who died from this infection and you look at the liver itself, it's absolutely perfect. There are no liver enzyme changes, nothing. So that the difference between ascaris and schistosomiasis is that schistosomes do this to the uh, portal okay. circulation and ascaris does not. And you, might, you would find ascaris <coughs> around Lake Victoria? Oh, heck yes. Yeah. Come on, Daniel. You must see that in every patient. You know, it, uh, this is actually, so these are some interesting points before we get to the unveil and find, like if you just saw a photo of this person and didn't have the opportunity to examine them, right? Yeah. You know, they, this child does look a lot like that picture of the, the yep, girl. Yep, who's, there are some similarities. You know, a bezoar of Ascaris. But I think the difference, and I'll say the big hint here, I think, we'll see when it gets unveiled, but was the description of ascites. This isn't a belly distended with asc- an ascaris bezoar in the, um, in mm-hmm. the stomach. This is actually a belly distended with fluid. And how's that fluid there? So, you know, if we are going to invoke um, scarring of the liver, portal hypertension, then I like schistosomiasis. Interesting enough, if you tested this child for ascaris eggs, you would, I, I think you would you find them. see them. Of course you would. You would. If you uh, were concerned that maybe this child had some degree of malnutrition, they probably do. Yeah. So this, this may fall into the category of one main diagnosis, but probably some other things contributing as well. Maybe there's malnutrition. Uh, maybe there's a low albumin in part from not getting enough protein in the diet. Maybe there's some other you know, parasitic diseases going on. Um, but yeah, I think ascites is the big one that draws you to scarring of the liver um, in this case. So could you look at the young boy and without examining him, know he has portal hypertension? So there are some things that you might, like from the picture, it's hard to see, right? I think, you know, we all looked at a picture of this boy. It's hard to see, actually. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, one of the things that might be a, a helpful distinction from just looking at a photograph or just standing back and looking at this boy is, you know, we'll, we'll talk about our differential. So one is, um, does does he have fluid there? We're going to say we think it's fluid there. Is it fluid there because of pressure or is it fluid there because he's malnourished and not getting enough protein? Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting, um, you know, maybe I'm going to call this a pearl, is the eyes, if you look at the child's eyes and you actually see this uh, sort of glistening in the eye, you mm -hmm. can actually get fluid uh, developing in the conjunctiva, what we call chemosis, from a lack of adequate protein to keep it in the circulation. So if you don't see that, you're thinking, okay, why is there so much fluid there in the belly? But I think there is that challenge. Like, how can I see from a picture that this is fluid versus that there's some mass in the belly? So I, I like, I like mm -hmm. you know, schistosoma as the prime diagnosis, but you probably need to add something, you know, some other diagnostic test to, to clarify. One would be, it'd be great on exam to see a fluid wave. You have the child just lay on their back and you actually, you, you can tap out and feel the fluid shifting around, telling you that it's coming from, you know, either portal hypertension or lack of oncotic pressure. So that fluid is going to help you. Um, but then you may want to do some diagnostic testing. And I don't know, before we find out from our unveil, uh, Dixon, what, what kind of diagnostic testing? Uh, maybe we should start with the old school. <laughs> so what, what, would, what would an old school parasitologist want? Well, as an old guy, I can tell you that we used to <laughs> just stick a hand up there and look for the worms. No, we didn't do that. <clears throat> no, I want to also add something though, Daniel, because I think there's another hint, there's another anatomical hint that you could get from looking at the abdominal wall itself, the exterior abdominal wall. The pressure that the uh, vessels experience during the blockage of the presinusoidal capillaries not only produces ascites fluid, it also triggers the formation of vessels which will circumvent the liver. And these vessels are right on the surface of the abdomen. And Ascaris does not do that because, of course, it's not obstructing the circulation. So if you look for, they used to call them spider veins or some. Or they cup, caput medusa, the head of caput medusa. Caput medusa. I like that. I like that yes. very much. So if you see that, it's like another, as you say, a, a hint or a, a pearl that you can take and say, well, I see this fluid in the eye and I see these spider veins. It's probably portal hypertension. And of course, epidemiologically yeah, yeah. speaking, um, millions of kids in Africa have ascaris without distended abdomens. Yeah. I mean, the so. other, which is an interesting thing that we could see in this picture was um, the umbilical hernia, right? You yeah, yeah, hernia yeah, yeah, region, yeah, 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 right? yeah, that's right. And that's, that's right. going to be fluid, right? If that's you're right. just that's full right. of worm, just full of worms, I mean, now, now we're going to be embarrassed at the unveil. If you're just full of worms, you wouldn't expect something to be extruding no. that umbilical hernia. And I'd never actually heard of um, uh, strangeloides uh, inducing that kind of a syndrome, although one of the uh, letters did refer to that. Uh, you know, the that, full of, the full of borny, um, variant. Yeah, okay, um, okay. Uh, I, yeah, that, right. and so I thought that was that actually... Might be, that was, might be right. That's right. Mm. Well, see, I didn't appreciate these subtleties, so I couldn't distinguish between um, the two, schistosome or um, ascaris. Well, that's that's why there's a medical school, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think this discussion we teach those differences. is very. This discussion is very good, right? Because now we learn how. Yeah, to absolutely, it to absolutely. It. So, okay, so what diagnostic test would I run? Which is old school. I would take a, a retinal snip. Um, first of all, I look in the stool, of course. But if in, in an old infection where the adult worms are not uh, are no longer reproducing, because they're being uh, uh, inhibited by the immune system, um, then you wouldn't find too many eggs. And the other thing that you might not find are living eggs. And that's one reason for taking the rectal snip and looking at fresh tissue to see if the eggs themselves have been produced recently or if they're calcified or if they're uh, dead. And there's a little excretory cell inside of each of these um, larvae inside the egg. Actually, there's a pair of them, and they look like flames. When you look at them under the microscope, they look like this. They, my fingers are going back and forth like sleep, sleep, you will go to sleep now. If you look in, under the microscope, you will actually see these little cells, and they're excretory cells that help the larvae inside the egg get rid of its wastes. 
Mm. And uh, when those are no longer moving or you can't even see them, then the eggs are dead. That means it's an old infection. And that used to be a concern because the drugs, remember, they were highly toxic. We don't give them unless they've got a live infection, so to speak. But today with Prozicuantil, they would just follow it up with the drug no matter what, I think. Yeah, now it now it would be easy. You could always, you know, the 600 milligram pills, you'd say, you know, based on height or weight. It's usually height interesting. You got these sticks. It's like you either take one or two, two for an adult, maybe one for a child of this size. Um, yep. And then you, just, you, you might repeat that if this is just a somiasis. Right. Which I think we're all hoping it is at this point. <laughs> Indeed. So should we should we have Dixon um, step out for a moment? Right. And Dixon, should I, we uh, have a special guest to do the unveil. I would gonna, happily step out for a step moment. Out. But when when our guest is done, you can come back, okay, Dixon? I'm turning off my camera as we speak. Our guest today is the founder and executive director of Soft Power Health, Jesse Stone. Welcome to TWIP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent and Daniel. Thank you for having me. Soft Power Health is in Uganda, right? Yes, we are based uh, along the banks of the Nile River, uh, just 10 kilometers north of the source of the Nile, Lake Victoria. And But you are not in Uganda at the moment. You're in somewhere in Europe, right? I, yes, <laughs> I, you could say I'm en route. I'm en oh. route back to, I, I'm in a, a, a temperature extreme from uh, what Uganda is at this moment. Where are you en route from? I, I'm in Switzerland at the moment. Okay. So snow, cold, all of that. And it's Uganda's hot, dry season right now. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we've just received a, a lot of case guesses about the case of yours that we read last time. So tell us about this uh, case and, and how you sorted it out. Okay. So, you know, we always have a variety of believe it or not, of cases that present like this. Um, and the most important uh, piece of history for this particular young boy was that he had had almost constant exposure to the waters of Lake Victoria for his entire life. And then the other part of the history was that he'd had an older brother who had died the year before from apparently the same disease, though the older brother never received a diagnosis. So they, so this particular family lives in a very remote community in Mayuge District, which is a district north of Jinja District, the district we are located in. And um, so after the, you know, getting this history of contact with water. And looking at the boy, the hugely distended abdomen, and he looks very, very wasted, very malnourished. Um, you know, this, this was really very extreme. We see milder versions of this, and, and you, you're, you, know, you may start going down the pathway of some malnutrition, severe acute malnutrition, or, you know, some other kind of um, infection or even, you know, some kind of a neoplastic process. But in this case, the history of being in constant exposure to Lake Victoria, and then the, your, your thinking has to go to realizing that Lake Victoria is the largest source in the world for schistosomiasis. That has to be in your, you know, your top three diagnoses at this point to rule out. So after uh, examining him, we did a rapid test for schistosomiasis, a urine test. It was positive. And then we began treatment. We also tapped his abdomen because it was so enormous. Um, you know, he was having trouble breathing, having trouble moving, could not sleep, couldn't lie flat and breathe at nighttime. And, um, you know, over the course of he's been, we've been treating him monthly for the last uh, three months He's improving, which is really terrific. And of course, adding to just the symptomatic treatment, we're treating with Praziquantel, which is the drug of choice to not only control but cure schistosomiasis. And um, I should say on the back of this, this past summer, we did a study at our clinic. Um, well, not at our clinic, but in the village where our clinic is based 
to figure out the prevalence of schistosomiasis in our home village there. And we found it to be 51% of the village infected. So that was a big eye opener for us. Um, you know, and then of course you're led to two different pathways, control of the condition and cure. You know, we obviously like to cure any case that comes in our door, but from a public health point of view, you may not be able to cure an entire village, but you can control. So that's, you know, we, we work closely with the local district medical office in Jinja and, um, you know, other control groups that are specifically based from the Ministry of Health on schistosomiasis. What, what does control involve? Control involves treatment with praziquantel, but, okay. it, you know, the specific measurements, like, for example, they will use height as opposed to weight, and they will to, you know, prescribe the dose, and then they will also say we'll do it twice a year as opposed to, you know, four times a year, which you really mm -hmm. want to do to cure it in this case. But there's, is there anything you can do to prevent them from getting infected to begin with? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I would say no, because, you know, people are in the Nile is the Nile and Lake Victoria are sources of water, uh, not only for drinking, for bathing, mm -hmm. um, for washing clothes, for swimming and enjoyment, also for fishing. You know, it's, it's, it's so it's a, a big part of life. And so it would be almost impossible to sort of remove people from contact with Nile River water or Lake Victoria River water, you know, so that's part of the problem. How so back to, it? oh, sorry, I was going to say back to the case, Dr. Stone. So um, you do the urine test, you, you say it's schisto. Um, do you do stool? Do you try to clarify, you know, you, is it? You, do, you yeah. definitely try to do stool. Um, it's not always possible to get a positive stool sample, even though you would hope to get that. But in this case, you know, sort of with the history and um, treating him and seeing that he's making this improvement, you know, you, you think we are definitely on the right pathway here, um, you know, and, and, he, and he looks better too. You know, as time goes on, he's making these small and small improvements. And my God, if we didn't do that, you know, then he's going on a, a direct pathway to not recover, to be like his brother. Yeah. So. How long would it have taken for him to get that abdominal girth and how how does it go without anyone oh, that's noticing? That's a really good question. And <laughs> I don't know if I can give you an answer because, you know, he's he's let's assume he's been infected since he was an infant and now he's, uh. you know, fourteen years old. Um, you know, we did go visit his family at home and found, you know, he lives literally 500 meters or less from the lake's edge, Lake Victoria's edge. So he's constantly in and out of the water as are all the neighborhood kids. And, you know, there is, in Uganda, there's a big effort to try to control schistosomiasis because it mm -hmm. does have such a huge burden and it's a neglected tropical disease. So outside of countries where, you know, where it is commonly known and people have heard of it, the rest of the world has never heard of it, um, or very few people, I should say. Um, so, it's really, you know, getting the educating people about the impact of the disease is one thing. You know, letting them, making them aware, this is what could happen if you come in contact with the water. You do need to be aware that you need to be treated. And, you know, just creating that awareness, I think, is very helpful for, for people. So they can also share that information with family, with their neighbors, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in our home village, after we did the study this summer, it was surprising how many people had not heard of schistosomiasis and how many people were unaware that it was a treatable condition. So, Daniel, in your, in your trips there, have you seen uh, such cases? So that, I mean, that, so certainly it's, it's you know, and, and I guess you could say how many cases have I seen not diagnosed when 50% of, you know, people yeah. in certain areas have it. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly the the village where they're fisher, the fishermen, the kids are all like in and out of the water, right? And uh, um, yeah. yeah, this is, uh, and, and I think we even had a little bit of a discussion about some people getting schistosomiasis who report never having actually swam in the lake and some concern about maybe some of the water that they're bathing and showering Coming Absolutely. From, yeah, Absolutely. coming from the lake. I mean, and so, yeah. There's, you know, where the piped water comes from, like, that's a, that's a major concern for some mm -hmm. people because there was an outbreak of schistosomiasis in Jinja town and people could not figure out where it was coming from. 
and it was localized to piped water that was coming out of Lake Victoria itself. I mean, it's also interesting to note that an infected snail has a three kilometer radius that it can actually infect with cercaria that will mm. then infect anyone who's in the water. Um, you know, so that's, you know, one deadly snail and it's a particular <laughs> type of snail. You know, it's not every snail. So you got to know your snails. Yeah, we were actually collecting snails when I was there last and, you know, identifying which which are the ones to worry about because, yeah, each different yeah. Um, subspecies has its own snail. And I, I know Dixon and I at one point talked about um, in, it was actually Puerto Rico many years back. That's the great thing about Dixon. He's been around for many years back. And about in Puerto Rico, in the pools, they would get the local water, right? Because you don't want to swim in the salt water, but maybe you did. And they would pipe it in, fill the swimming pools. And there were people that would get schistosomiasis from swimming in the fancy swimming pools, oh, which no. were being filled <laughs> from, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. The suboptimal, very yeah. suboptimal. <laughs> So when, when you return to Uganda, are you going to see this young, this young boy? Yes, absolutely. So he was already followed up at our clinic earlier in January, and then he's, he's got a follow, another follow-up point, appointment. I believe it is February 9th, so I'll see him then for sure. We'll have to coordinate when I'm, when I'm back in Uganda to, uh, to see him, to see his progress. Yes, definitely. I'll have to, definitely. I'll have to swing by. I'll, I'll, you know, maybe instead of riding on the back of a boat, a boat, I'll come Please by Please don't do that time. again. You made me so nervous. <laughs> 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 when are you going back, Daniel? Um, I'm going to try at least to be back there in December, if not sooner. So. All right. Okay, uh, so, great. So you said 50% of the village... Uh, is infected. So how often would you see, not maybe not a case as severe as this, but obvious cases? Like I mean, this? quite frequently, you know, mm -hmm. the problem, our problem is honestly, the, so as I mentioned before, the stool, you know, getting a positive specimen by stool is more infrequent than, you know, having a rapid test used on urine. Mm -hmm. The problem is getting the rapid tests is not so easy. You have, we have to import those tests from South Africa and they're very, very expensive. So we run out of them quick. Mm -hmm. And so that's another, you know, like little hiccup. I think we would be diagnosing more um, schistosomiasis, you know, if we had a steady stream of rapid tests, for example. And then also you have to ask yourself too, you know, like any rapid test, it is not 100% sensitive and specific. So there could be other things that are mm -hmm. making this test positive. Right. And... Um, you know, so, but basically with the history, the history is the critical piece of the picture. Yeah, case. I think when I was there in Jinja, you just showed me the picture and that was, you know, the first uh, yeah. <laughs> comes to mind. But yeah, um, yeah so I, I know your story, uh, Dr. Stone, but um, I, I bet our listeners would love to, you know, what, what are you, you know, what's, what's a girl, what's a girl from, you know, Westchester, New York doing in a place like Uganda? What's, <laughs> what's your story? Well, it's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a funny little story. Um, I, yes, you, you know that my, my, in my other life, I am a um, whitewater kayaker and um, that has been sort of my parallel life alongside of medicine. And I was invited on an expedition trip to the Nile 20 years ago in 2003. And when I went on this trip, um, one of the people on this, on the expedition trip with me got malaria and I ended up having to treat him. And then I looked around and said, well, if, you know, he's taking prophylaxis and sleeping under a net, what happens to the local people here? You know, do they have malaria all the time. What is the story? And then that led to me being introduced to a woman from the village where our clinic is now based, uh, who led me on a 50 home survey. We went house to house with a little survey asking people if they understood how malaria was transmitted, if they had a mosquito net, if they were interested in learning more about malaria transmission, how much money roughly a month they spent on treatment. And, you know, the it, it was it was quite shocking because the in 50 homes that we visited, there wasn't a single person who could tell us how malaria was transmitted. Mm -hmm. So then they didn't understand, you know, why they would need a mosquito net. But everyone was very enthusiastic about wanting to learn more and also being willing to purchase a mosquito net at a subsidized price. And uh, so that led to the first sort of program, if you will, of soft power health, which was 
this malaria education and prevention program, which started in the home village where we're based now, which is Chibera. And then it went to all the neighboring villages and then throughout our sub county. And it was very, very popular for, you know, I mean, who knew? Um, after the positive results of that, the LC1, who's like the mayor of the village, came to me and said, if the community donates land, would you like to build us a clinic? Mm. And not knowing anything about it, I said, sure, it sounds like a great <laughs> idea. So <laughs> that's what happened. We completed the clinic in 2006, opened the doors on January 19th, 2006. And so we have been going you know, since then. And so now we're up to this past year, we treated 35,000 patients at the at the health clinic, and then we reached another 25,000 through health education outreach programs for malaria, family planning, malnutrition, uh, domestic anti-domestic violence, and um, organic gardening. So we're we're trying to get a sort of comprehensive education, prevention, and treatment approach going. How did you pay for the uh, the clinic? How did I pay for it? Fundraising. <laughs> what I do when I'm not in Uganda. So right. when I'm back in the States or in Switzerland, um, I definitely, my mm -hmm. partner is Swiss. That's the main reason I'm in Switzerland. But I make use of my time to try to raise money to keep everything going. You're, you're, uh, the, the, the parent company is a nonprofit, right? Yes. Yes. We are a nonprofit registered in uh, the U.S., U.S.-based 501c3, and then in Uganda, we are an NGO registered. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Just like Parasites Without Borders and Microbe TV, right, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, we'll have to we'll have to leave a link um, because hopefully people are getting excited and will want to, you know, be yeah. part and contribute. It's Great. a beautiful yes. clinic. Yeah, it's a beautiful well, clinic. Thank I, you. You happen to come on the quietest day of the entire <laughs> year, so you need to come back. Uh, definitely. How often? How often are you there? Jessie? I'm there three times a year for you know anywhere from a month to two or two and a half months at a time. Mm. So, yeah. and when you're not there, you're in Switzerland. I'm in Switzerland, or I'm back in New York, even because my mother is. Uh, she lives in outside of New York City, so I go mm -hmm. back and see my mom and U.S. family. So, so do you have any uh, affiliations, hospital affiliations? Yes, or? we work. We have spent um, over 15 years working with Mount Sinai's Global Health Program, okay. and so we've had. Um, Medical students, residents, MPH students come and work with us um, over that time, which has been really mm -hmm. fun and terrific. And in fact, it was a Mount Sinai MPH student that worked on this uh, paper on the schistosomiasis prevalence with our doctors at the clinic this past summer. So, so as when, soon as it comes when, out, I'll send it to you guys. <laughs> love it. When you first went to that trip, 20 years ago, what were you doing here in the U.S. at the time? I was a professional whitewater kayaker. I had left medicine. Uh, I was ah. a stray, uh, you know, <laughs> I was like, I need to find what my path is in medicine. And it's not in this traditional, you know, setting that I had been groomed for. Uh. And I had, I had uh, thought at the time that I had a really small window of opportunity for my professional whitewater career. You know, and um, the crazy thing is that I've been able to continue both uh, together in Uganda. <laughs> so that's been really nice for me. Wow. It's, it's a very interesting career path for sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Where did you go to medical school? New York Medical College. Okay. In Valhalla. And so you grew up in the New York area, I presume. I did. I grew up in the New York area, but I went out west. I went to California for my college days. And then I was a philosophy and political science major. And then I had a an injury during my last year of college. And I was thought at the last minute, I want to be a doctor. So then I went back and did a post back pre-med program at the University of Pennsylvania and then to medical school. So lots of school. So after medical school, did you do residency? Typical? Nope. I did no? a kayaking residency. <laughs> That's cool. I'm seeing a lot of parallels here. I was a philosophy major myself. Oh, my, were you? Okay. Yeah, my interest in medicine was after a number of pretty severe ski accidents. 
Um, yeah, so uh, okay. <laughs> I, well, I think the lesson is study philosophy and get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny you say that because actually when I had this shoulder injury, I had been determined to go skiing and I had a really heavy backpack with this huge book of Plato dialogues. And I was like, I'll study in the lodge at lunch. And I did. But then I skied at the end of the day and had this wipeout and dislocated my shoulder. And that was the beginning of the path into medicine. So if if you hadn't become a professional kayaker, what part what kind of medicine would you have done, do you think? You know, I was really interested in emergency medicine, but mm -hmm. I think what's so ironic about that is that we say our the joke sort of throughout Uganda is that there are no emergencies because there's no emergency medical system. So things mm -hmm. are emergent problems but nothing is triaged in the way that you would see in the US or the developed world. You know, there's yeah. there's a lot of, and the other aspect of that too, is that you have to pay before you get any treatment in Uganda, in most places. You know, if you, mm. if you even if it's an emergency, if you don't have money on hand, you will not be seen. You know, and that's why mm. so many people die waiting for care. So yeah. at, at and your, your clinic- And your clinic is subsidized- Not at our clinic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, our clinic, we, we charge a subsidized price that covers the cost of um, your visit with the doctor, all of your medication, and your lab tests. And it's very affordable for everybody. And then there's a whole subset of patients who really, really can't afford, and we completely sponsor their care, 100%. So who works at your clinic? Are they are MDs and Yes, so medical forth? officers, uh, yeah. clinical officers, nurses, uh, laboratory technicians, physical therapists, um, ultrasonographers. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Lots of uh, outreach educators, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's sort of uh, social workers, domestic violence counselors, things like that. And where do they come from? Are they, are They're they all local? Ugandan. The staff is 100% Ugandan. Mm -hmm. And um, so all hired and, you know, locally and from yeah. within. Great. And then, you know, but as I said before, we, we yeah. collaborate with Mount Sinai. And then we've done some collaboration as well with the Wayne State um, Medical School. Would seem Detroit. like a good, good opportunity for, say, medical students or residents to come and see what it's like to, to work in such a setting, right? Absolutely. And whenever they do come, they really have a lot of fun, too. You know, it's it's yeah. a it's an eye opening experience um, for everybody. I mean, it's an eye opening experience for me every day that I'm at the clinic or I'm out in the field. Which reminds me, Daniel, when this is finished, I'll tell you about a patient I saw um, two days before I was leaving the country. Okay, was, great. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I always love interesting cases. Yeah, um, and this is, I mean, this is probably good. So I was just teaching for um, our other TWIP co-host, uh, Christina Nala. Um, there's a uh, Diploma of Tropical Medicine course in Glasgow. And a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, sort of some of the students were saying, oh my gosh, I'm disappointed to hear that. But a lot of students go through this training and then they're just not really sure how to get an opportunity to apply that, to go to these places. So, right. um, you know, I often recommend floating doctors that I work with in Panama, um, you know, our clinic in Peduta, you know, the FIMRIC right. Foundation. Right. So, um, but, you know, it sounds like soft power is potentially another place for these newly minted tropical medicine trained people to get their feet wet, sure. so to speak. Absolutely. And we definitely take, you know, we take all kinds of volunteers. We take medical volunteers and non-medical as well. Um, and, you know, in fact, we have a doctor nurse um, couple coming in February from the UK, from a UK program who are really interested in tropical medicine. So we're, you know, not just US, but we'll take, we are happy to have people from wherever come work with us. Well, congratulations on making such a great place. It's really inspiring. Well, thank you. And I hope you'll come visit sometime. <laughs> I told Daniel I might come with him one of these days. Great. Would, would love yeah. to, yeah. Wonderful. And Jinja is a very nice place as, you know, as far as, I, you know, I think they would have the level of, of luxury and comfort that Vincent has grown accustomed to. I'm not <laughs> sure about Verduda. That might be a little rough on Vincent, but uh, Jinja is a beautiful can, little town. I'm, I'm okay. I, I can handle it. No problem. <laughs> no, we, things have progressed. Things are definitely, you can find very comfortable accommodation. All right. Jesse Stone, Soft Power Health, thanks so much for joining us. 
Thank you very much. That was terrific. I appreciate it. Wow. So that was um, actually that was well. It's nice that we were right that it um, you know that it looks like it was uh, schistosomiasis and and actually interesting. You know, this is I guess new technology. Maybe some of our listeners are not familiar with, um, but there are these antigen tests now that you can get from right. South Africa. There's a couple different antigens. I guess it's CCA or CAA. Um, and you could actually, um, even in an old infection like this, you can actually do a urine antigen detection. Um, mm -hmm. And I think get around some of the challenges that Dixon talked about where you might not see them in the stool. Um, you know, you're not super excited about doing a rectal snip in some of these conditions. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, and I think really exciting to hear the follow-up that this boy is actually improving um, you know, his, his malnutrition was addressed with the high protein milk. That's um, he was treated with the Praziquantel, and that will probably be repeated. Um, and it's nice, I think, as one of our emailers wrote in, that when you treat um, some of these individuals, uh, you can actually see what, what looks like improvement, what looks like maybe some reversal of the fibrotic process. I don't know if it's so much reversal of fibrosis as reversal right. of the inflammation associated with the fibrosis. Right. I want to add one more thing also to the uh, description of its life cycle. How do these eggs actually get out into the lumen of the small intestine or into the bladder? And they, they actually lice their way into that area. They, they produce inside the, the larva or the schistosomula, the future schistosomula inside the egg actually produces proteases that it secretes. And these proteases permeate the egg wall, go outside into the tissue and actually lice the tissue and make it very easy for these eggs to actually slide along these tunnels of uh, lytic uh, prior normal host tissue, uh, eventually accumulating in the small intestine underneath the mucosa, and then eventually the mucosa erodes and out come the eggs. So that's the reason why a lot of times when you do look for the infection by stool examination, you don't find the eggs right away. So you have to take a lot of stool, and you have to look like three or four days in a row. And if you do that, you'll likely find the eggs. I so we used to look real hard for them in the lab. I also want to point out that one of the listeners, one of the writers had asked about draining the ascites. And in fact, that's what uh, Dr. Stone talked about, right, Daniel? Yeah, no, and this this is a challenge. You know, there's, you know, it seems so simple. Oh, just a semiosis, here's some praziquantel. But the management can be challenging. Um, you can drain some of the ascites, but we need to be careful not to drain too much right. um, because then you can actually induce what we call this hepatorenal syndrome. You trigger renal failure. Um, so, you know, management of a child like this actually takes some pretty uh, significant thought and care. And the other thing is, the <laughs> just to add to the complications, if they're at that stage of the infection and the, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the extra hepatic circulation has already developed, then you've got accumulation of eggs in the lungs and you've got accumulation and then you've got the possibility for something called core pulmonale, which is a pressure not just – when you get the presinusoidal capillaries blocked and producing ascites fluid, but now you get pressure back on the heart, which is trying to pr push blood through the lungs. And the eggs are preventing that from happening. And then as a result, the oxygen tension drops, the heart enlarges, and you just keep doing. This is a cycle that's going in the wrong direction, obviously. So those are those are tragic outcomes of this infection in some people. They die of heart failure. Or they die of uh, uh, reduced, way reduced um, lung capacity. All right, we have to give away a book. To we have to. One of our. <laughs> we get a drum roll, Dixon. Can you sure, drum roll? Us? We had seven applicants. Are you ready, ready? Dixon? I'm ready. <laughs> Number seven. <laughs> Is Tom. We should find out if Tom wants the book sent to Uganda or if we can send it to Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went up for Minnesota, but. <laughs> yeah, let us know, Tom. Save us some money. Let us send it to you in Minnesota. Next time you come home, pick up the book. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, Tom, give us an email, twip at microbe.tv, which you know because you sent in a guess, and let us know uh, where you would like the book sent. If, if you really would like it in Uganda, just you have to give us a phone number as well for the shipping. All right. 
now <laughs> it's time. <laughs> Maybe Daniel has a new case. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I don't I know do what you think, actually. Vincent. He has another case. <laughs> yeah, no, I have another case. And this is, again, um, I think very exciting. Um, we are going to, again, have a guest do the unveiling friend of mine. Oh, wow. Um, and so uh, let me let me present the case, and then we'll have a very similar episode next time. We get to read a bunch of emails, uh, guesses, and then we will have this guest come on for the unveil. So here we go. A 49-year-old German male is seen in Germany with significant gross hematuria. So he's basically, he's got red urine, bloody urine. Um, he reports no travel outside of Europe, but does report that he visited France twice, seven years before and one year before. Uh, he reports swimming in the Solenzara River in the southeastern part um, of the island of Corsica near a busy campsite. He might have gone into the Gravana River in western Corsica near um, Ajaccio at a turtle park and near a campsite and uh, also may have swam in the Tavignano River. Um, the patient also reported swimming in the Restanica River. This guy was in a lot of rivers. <laughs> um, he's, a swimmer. he's a big swimmer. <laughs> but he reports never swimming in the Kavu River. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> and uh, actually, this, this whole history is actually verified using GPS data from his smartphone camera, and I think the microchip from a vaccination. No, that was a joke, sorry. <laughs> um, he, he reconstructed um, his bathing sites precisely, and so this history was confirmed. Um, his exam was unremarkable. Um, his complete blood count uh, was also unremarkable. So no elevation of the white cells, uh, no elevation or diminution of the eosinophils, uh, no shift of any sort. Um, this complaint triggered uh, cystoscopy. This is where they pass a very small scope um, up into the bladder um, and biopsies were, were taken and sent for a histological analysis under the microscope. Um, the findings that they uh, found here triggered referral to the Tropical Medicine Department at uh, LMU Hospital in Munich. Now, in the next episode, we will have a guest to discuss this case as well as tell us a bit about themselves. And I'm also hoping people will tell us um, what they think this might be then but then perhaps do a little bit of research and maybe go into a little more detail. I, I'm going to say, don't just say, I think it's this. Tell us maybe a little bit more <laughs> about why you think it's that. What would be the, the thing to do? So, And I, I, I guess, Vincent Dixon, did you have any, um, any questions well, at this point? You can't answer them, right, Daniel? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I could always say I don't know, but I might know even more than I'm letting on. But uh, So this— well, Sir, go ahead, Vincent. This person uh, has a family, no family. How's I don't. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> HIV status. He's HIV negative. I could give you that. Okay. Did did he, I uh, think he drinks beer. You know, he is German, so yeah, I'm just making a. <laughs> but they drink more wine than beer in Germany, by the way. I don't know if you know that or not. That's an okay. actual fact. I don't know where I read that, but I did read that somewhere. Um, well, we'll have to ask our guest about this, who himself is a German. So. Was there any pain on urination? No, there was no described pain. So, Nothing. Asymptomatic except for hematuria. Just, just having the, the red urine. Did that occur suddenly or was that over time? Was it like un, un My understanding is it developed over a little bit of time. And then yeah. It was a gradual hematuria. Mm-hmm. But I don't think Germans pee blood for very long before they seek medical attention. Well, nobody does, actually. <laughs> now, you'd be surprised, Dixon. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, maybe I would be surprised, but... <clears throat> Some parts of the world, um, starting to pee blood is, you know... Well, that's the old Egyptian concept of uh, male um, maturation uh, that you can see in the hieroglyphs, but that was actually from Schistosoma hematobium, right? In, in males. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this, I can't imagine. Well, I'm not going to go there. I, I won't start to tell you what yeah, I Yeah, no guesses yet. No, no, no. no you won't get any guesses Thank from me. You. All right. Thank you, Daniel. That'll do it for TWIP 213. Today is January 24th, so you can expect us to 
record in about a month. Do we actually have a date, Daniel? I don't remember. We're going to shoot for the 16th of February. <clears throat> 16th. That's a day after, two days after a Valentine's Day. Yeah. So maybe when people get together on Valentine's Day, they could, you know, this might be a romantic thing. <laughs> they reminisce to about the, the Schistosome adults enjoying <laughs> themselves in the capillaries of the small right, intestine. Well, get your guesses in before <laughs> February 16th, folks. You can send them to twip at microbe.tv. Microbe.tv slash twip is where you'll find the show notes. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting us. So we have few days left for the Parasites Without Borders campaign. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Go there, click the donate button. It, uh, for the rest of this month, your donations will go to support the work of Microbe TV and, and Parasites Without Borders will double them up to uh, an amount of $40,000. So wow. get them in. We'd appreciate it. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Daniel Griffin's at... Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. Dixon DePommier, Trichinella.org, TheLivingRiver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent and Daniel. Good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is parasitic. Parasitic.